we know why we have a heroin epidemic and it's not because people just like drugs. It's because we allowed the Sackler family to turn our doctors into pill pushers. And we did it by allowing them to corrupt our politics. And these are people who should be in jail. So it's just like if you commit fraud, if you murder people, as long as you do it with a spreadsheet, you get a bonus instead of a jail sentence. And I think that's a, that's a crisis. This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with an old friend, Matt Stoller. I think we've known each other since uh, well, longer than I can remember, probably uh, 2004, 2005, 2006 window. We worked together on a campaign with Ned Lamont and many, many things subsequently. And how would I say, I just, uh, I find you to be a guiding light in the realm between politics and economics and the well-being of society. Matt's worked with Financial Services Committee on the House of Representatives. He's worked with the Senate Budget Committee. And right now he's the head of research at the American, is, I believe it's called the American Economic Liberties Project, and is the author of a very powerful book, Goliath, The Hundred Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy. Uh, Matt has been how would I call uh, an illuminator of the tensions as a society for many, many years, maybe about 15, 16 years now. And it's really a delight to have you back and discuss where we are after a hundred days plus of the Biden administration, what's on the horizon, what haunts you, what do you cheer for? What do you applaud? So I want to get into this in a little bit to talk about, the big tech world, which is what I, I spend a lot of time focusing on in antitrust. The, there was a big antitrust suit filed against Amazon yesterday. Um, it's likely that Lena Khan, who is a great uh, Brandeisian antitrust type, is going to be uh, confirmed to the Federal Trade Commission at some point in the next month. There, things are, I think, looking much better than I assumed when I, you know, if you had told me in October um, how's it, how's the Biden administration going to work out? I would not have, I would not have pegged them as being this uh, aggressive, but I want to start with something different, which is the, I guess what haunts me. Let's go there. So I'm reading this book, Empire of Pain, which is on the opioid crisis. And it's just a wonderfully written this book. This is Patrick Grigg Keith's, Keith's book. That's uh -huh. right. Um, and it's a, it's a really fun read. It's not just a, it's not just a, a a good, like, it's not just a good story. It's, it's actually fun. I mean, it's a depressing topic, but it's actually not a depressing book, which is very hard to do. Uh, but what is, I think it's a really amazing story about our modern America and how our economic order works, because it's basically the story of heroin dealers, the, the Sackler family, um, they made Oxycontin knowing that it was addictive, that it was very similar to heroin. And they, in, they induced a, a prescription drug and then heroin uh, crisis. And they knowingly did it, um, but they didn't do it alone. Um, they did it by uh, taking advantage of a corrupt political system. They corrupted, uh, they, they hired corrupt actors and they, they also corrupted others. They the, corrupted the, federal, the FDA. Uh, they hired... Uh, Mary Jo White, who you and I know well as Obama's SEC chair, but she was working for the Sacklers in uh, the mid 2000s, as was Rudy Giuliani, um, Eric Holder. And, you know, they almost there were some Virginia federal prosecutors who had the Sacklers dead to rights with probably with felony charges, mail fraud, wire fraud, so on and so forth. Uh, and they were going to bring those charges against the executives at the firm, and then they were going to flip to the Sackler family themselves. You know how the how you flip the um, mob. You, you start with the mid level guys, and then you you go work way up. They were going to do that, and uh, Mary Jo White actually got went over their heads, went to the political people, and got them off the case, basically. And uh, it's just this really stunning, and just a, kind of at every stage, Mary Jo White has been helping really the bad guys here. Um, but it's, it's a story, I mean, of, of this happened in lots of different ways. McKinsey was helping them. I mean, we know this. It, it, there were lots of, you know, they funded lots of think tanks in D.C. 
we know why we have a heroin epidemic and it's not because people just like drugs. It's because we allowed the Sackler family to turn our doctors into pill pushers. And we did it by allowing them to corrupt our politics. And these are people who should be in jail. And people like Mary Jo White should be in jail. And the McKinsey consultants who helped set up this heroin epidemic should be in jail. But they're not. And it's because we have a broad crisis with the rule of law as applied to the powerful. We also have one as applied to the powerless. We're seeing a lot of protests around that. But we have one, I think, that's unacknowledged that I think is more serious, no, maybe not more serious, but is, is linked intimately with the way that we enforce the law against the powerless. The, the mirror image is how we don't enforce it against the powerful. And I'm talking about corporate CEOs and billionaires and, and the legal, legal elites like Mary Jo White. And that's a crisis for our society. It's something that you and I saw since the financial crisis. No one went to jail for the financial crisis. I think it started a little bit before that. I think it was 2005 or six is when it kind of really got bad. It was, you know, in America, you always had two systems of justice, but it's particularly bad right now. Um, so it's just like if you commit fraud, if you murder people, as long as you do it with a spreadsheet, you get a bonus instead of a jail sentence. And I think that's a, that's a crisis. It is also the crisis that we're dealing with with big tech. It is the crisis, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, they have been caught for fraud multiple times, lying to advertisers, lying to publishers, knowingly to induce more spending on Facebook. There are multiple consent decrees with the Federal Trade Commission. It's similar with the other firms as well. They routinely lie, commit perjury and whatnot. And so, and that's just a, that's kind of like a, a, a legacy of this policy framework that we, an ideological framework that we inherited from the Bush administration and the Obama administration of simply not enforcing the rule of law against the powerful. And so that's, I think, the dynamic that we're dealing with today. And it's across, it's across every sector of the economy, right? It's not just, it's not just opioids. It's not just big tech. It's kind of everywhere. And what this does is two things. When you have effectively lawlessness for white collar elites, it, it both penalizes honest business people who cannot compete when they're not willing to lie, uh, steal and cheat. And you can't, if you, if the other guy's allowed to lie, steal and cheat, and you don't want to do that, you lose, right? So it undermines honest business. And then it also creates a situation where criminals become the pinnacle of society. And I think we saw that with Trump, where Trump, you know, Cy Vance, who is the DA of Manhattan, a Democrat, he had them dead to rights on real estate fraud years ago, way before he was kind of in politics. And he just, Trump's lawyer gave Cy Vance some campaign money and Cy Vance didn't, didn't bring the case. And so if that, if he had just brought that case, if he had said, this is a criminal act to defraud people of their money, Trump wouldn't have been in politics, right? But because he didn't, Trump was in politics. And I think what people saw in 2016 was, well, they're all crooks. So I'm going to pick the guy that appeals to me. And the thing is, is that analysis, they're all crooks, is right. They are all crooks. And I, not everyone, obviously, but like the structure of our elite society, if you look at it, it's just designed to incentivize criminal behavior, lying, cheating, and stealing at the highest level. And that's the reaction. We're seeing a reaction to that, and there are many different reactions to that. One of them is the sort of Trumpist reaction. Another one is kind of the Lena Khan and the FTC reaction. But that's what I think, that's where our politics is right now. And the Biden administration is kind of a transition moment, right? Just like the Trump administration was kind of a transition moment to a new kind of politics, we're not totally sure what, what that's gonna be. I think that that's similar with the Biden administration. It's a transition moment to a new form of politics and we're a little bit unsure about whether we're gonna address this problem with the rule of law. It's not just criminal law, it's also antitrust law, insider trading, um, the kind of all of finance. I mean, you look at SPACs, those are all just kind of, that's just crooked behavior, um, insider dealing. Are we, gonna, are we gonna address that in a meaningful way? Are we gonna restore equal political rights to all, or are we gonna go and 
kind of transition sort of officially into an oligarchy and shed the vestiges of democracy that we have? I think that your diagnosis is exactly right. And this place, this limbo you describe with the Biden administration is fascinating. They are at what uh, that blues singer with my name, Robert Johnson, called the crossroads, and they got to choose the path. So, uh, but let's talk a little bit about where does the truth come from and where does the impetus for deep structural reform in response to the Trump-like, the despair of a Trump-like return? Uh, how do you see that? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think that the truth, this is going to sound cheesy, but I think that the truth lies in the, in, in the, the heart of the public. I think the public has views of, about how politics works and politicians respond to those views. And you have a bunch of elite institutions, which I think are corrupt um, across the board. And, but, you know, the public kind of creates the wind. Those elite institutions are kind of like the sailboat, right? And you can, you can put the sail in lots of different ways, but ultimately, like, if it doesn't, if the wind is blowing in one direction or the other, that determines what you can do more than how amazing the boat is. But the boat is something that you can control. So you're kind of like looking at, elites like to look at the boat and decide, oh, this, should we do this thing or should we use that sail or this other mechanism, but the wind is what is really matters. And I think one, one thing that I've noticed, um, and I think people don't really, particularly Democrats, you know, they don't want to admit it. Um, but Obama was a really bad president and it matters that he was a really bad president, that his policies, he, he pursued policies that concentrated wealth and power into the hands of corrupt actors, not necessarily for bad reasons. He was a he might have been doing it in good faith. It's not a personal comment on him. But the consequences of his policies were horrific. And they made us a weaker country, an angrier country, uh, a more frustrated country. The opi opioid crisis exploded on his watch. And it wasn't that the Republicans were mean to him. He had bad ideas. Uh, and he used his political power to pursue those bad ideas. He put people in like Geithner and Michael Froman and a whole bunch of others to do bad things, to offshore jobs. Uh, and they, they did it because they thought, you know, to bail out Wall Street, to enact a foreclosure crisis, to essentially grant amnesty for white collar executives for crime. And they did it because they, they felt they had to. They did it because they had an ideology that said, this is what you do. Corporations and banks are technical neutral institutions. You don't touch the experts of our society, AKA what I would call the white collar crooks. And that, that was catastrophic. And Biden isn't doing that. When, what happened in the last four years is that the Democrats basically acknowledged that every policy that Obama touched was bad. And we should do the opposite of what he did. He was great. The Democrats are still like, ah, oh, he's wonderful. But let's just do the opposite of everything that he did policy wise. So they've sort of separated out politics and policy in this very strange way. And that's really helpful because it, it actually offers a real sense of hope. It, if what we did was, it, okay, so it's like if Obama tried his best and was trying to do awesome things and yet it was catastrophic, that's one problem. And it means like, what do you do? I mean, if you use all your political power to try to do great things and it doesn't work out, like that's a really hard problem. But if Obama was actually working hard to impoverish the middle class and destroy, you know, stability in American society, not for you know, he thought he was doing the right thing, but he wasn't. Then it's actually not hard to figure out what to do. You just don't do the same policies. You just do different policies, right? And so that's why I'm actually like pretty hopeful because what Biden is doing is, you know, he's just not doing what Obama did. He's trying to like actually help people using, you know, spending and government power. And he's screwing a bunch of things up too, but he's not actively malevolent in his policy outlook. And that's so much better. And it's hard for Democrats to see that because they can't admit that Obama was just really as bad as he actually was. They have all sorts of excuses to like pull the wool over their eyes about what he was trying to do, just like the Republicans have excuses for why Trump was amazing and, and like was America first, even though he didn't actually bring back jobs and all the rest of it. It's like people have their delusions. And I think so. So that's that's one thing that gives me significant amounts of hope. The reason that people have shifted so aggressively 
is because they we have dropped the ideology of neoliberalism. That ideology was so fundamentally strong in 2008, and it was really hard for political leaders to break from that, not just because the elite institutions and all the money was there, but because the public kind of believed in it, right? And they didn't, they weren't, they didn't strongly believe in it, but they, they were easily persuaded that the, it was true on any particular issue area. And I think that that's really changed. People don't look at banks as neutral technical institutions. They don't trust bankers anymore. They don't trust, you know, executives. They don't trust the powerful. It's not that they trust the right people, but, you know, but they've lost their faith in that ideology. And so I think you can fundamentally make a different pitch and you can pursue different policies. And that's what Trump did in many cases. It's what uh, Biden is doing and just kind of ignoring a lot of the like uh, conventional wisdom, economists and and sort of wise oracles who have been really problematic. And so you're seeing changes. It's not just like the Lena cons of the world. It's also, you know, they've said they hit big pharma badly and they said, we want you, we're going to force you to license the the uh, patents and and design product design and copyrights that you have that we paid for. We're going to work. You can make money off of them, but we're going to force you to share that expertise with other with firms in other uh, countries so that we can actually take care of the pandemic and you'll, you'll get royalties and and whatnot. But that was a huge deal. And it was just because the Biden administration you know, has agency and power and they thought through what they, what the Obama administration did. And they said, we're not going to handle it like that. We're going to, we're going to try to, you know, build out a, a something for the, for the public good. And it, I think it, part of it is fear. I think they saw what Trump did and they were afraid that that would come back. But I think a lot of it is just an intellectual and ideological change where they're just like, wait a second, all those priors we had from the 1980s until the 2000 and teens were just wrong. Let's do it differently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can go back as far as uh, the Reagan years, the formation of the Democratic Leadership Council. Right. In response, Tom Ferguson and Joel Rob, uh, Rogers' book, Right Turn, really tells the story of the fear within the Democratic Party of being drowned by a stampede of fundraising to the Republican side. And then the neoliberal ideology and all kinds of things emerged during Bill Clinton's administration and continued on. Perhaps, I guess, in listening to your narrative, the, uh, how would I say, the contradictions hadn't become so fiercely painful and evident at the time Obama ran in 2008 uh, as they are now. But I understand there's a book uh, coming out uh, by a man named Edward, Edward Isaac Devere called Battle for the Soul, Inside the Democratic Campaign to Defeat Trump. And apparently it's very critical of the Obama presidency as a, how would I say, catalyst to the despair that produced Trump. I don't, I mean, I think personally being critical of the like character of Obama is, you know, really not going to get you anywhere in democratic politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But basically he was saying... I'll do some political events for Democrats, but don't make sure it doesn't in 2018, but make sure it doesn't in, get in, in the way of any of my golf games or my paid speaking gigs and keep those paid speaking gigs out of the press. And it's like the guy is going all over the world, making a ton of money speaking, you know, not anymore, I guess, because it's of COVID, but like he was speaking at, at like, you know, business to business software confer conferences next to Ashton Kutcher to make whatever, $500,000. Like, what? why do you need that? Like, that's so mm -hmm. lame, right? I mean, it, it's, you know, the, 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 the character of the, the, you know, I mean, their political judgment of Obama and a lot of his people was just terrible and really hostile to, you know, really anti-democratic too. So I think, I think that's like what the Democrats are really wrestling with, which is like, how do you, admit that. And I think that there's like this, you know, there's this kind of like awakening and, you know, Isaac, Isaac's book, I guess, is going to sort of bring that forward and tell that story. But it's like, you know, I mean, it, it's important to recognize that my, like, if you look at Biden, he's not like some amazing guy. He's just like a political operator, but he's doing so much better than what we've seen. Um, 
Yeah. Well, a lot of people say because in his own personal life he suffered some very acute crises, that he has the kind of empathy that Franklin Roosevelt was sensitive to after having uh, battled with polio himself. So that you can be elite, you can be in a power structure, but you still have a, what you might call a different sensibility within yourself. That's, that's what his allies are suggesting now. Well, that might be true. And I mean, I can, I can go into what I think of Biden, but I think that it's just on a, on a very much kind of more basic level, you don't have to boost up Biden. Like the comparison is Obama and Obama mm -hmm. was terrible. Like you can literally be a ham sandwich and be so much better than Obama <laughs> just by not trying to like sign the TPP, I mean, like yeah. by not doing all of the bailouts and the foreclosure crises. Like that's what I think is hard to get across is this, you don't have to make a, you don't have to say Biden's amazing. You don't have to puff this guy up. You just look at his straight policies and say, he did this, he did that, he didn't do this, he didn't do that. And because the, the comparison is, it's so much, it's the, the baseline is so bad. That's why, like, you know, I mean, that America is a lot of strengths and the American culture and the American people are basically a very democratic people. We don't like concentrated power. We're generally pretty tolerant. Um, it is a it is a remarkable culture. You have to put a lot of effort into destroying it. And and since Reagan you know, and the Democrats and the Republicans, Clinton, Bush, Obama, they really worked hard and our elites have really worked hard to destroy this country. And you have to work hard because this country has immense regenerative force. Um, so all Biden is doing is kind of like taking his, you know, is, 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 is stopping that, that aggressive attempt to destroy this country. Like, yeah. and, and that's why, you know, I mean, I don't know if he's doing it enough. I don't know if he's, you know, being aggressive enough. I don't know if he's making decisions fast enough, but certainly the baseline is, is really low. Yeah. Well, you can, you know, some people would tell the story that Obama, by becoming the first black president, was addressing one of the, what you might call, original sin in crimes against the founding principles of our country. And then he was viewed as becoming finance tech elite, seduce and abandon. Then Trump comes in, the system is rigged, and people are sensitive and rebelling against that despondency. But then what he does is turn around and supports the fossil fuel industry and cuts taxes for the very wealthy, and he seduces and abandons the people. What I sense now is that the, uh, what you might call the cynicism or the elite condescension in both parties about how you can hoodwink the public has, has uh, you might call confidence in the ability to hoodwink the public is way down. And now uh, I think the recovery of confidence, to quote John W. Gardner's famous book, uh, he and Bill Moyers founded uh, Common Cause together, but how we rebuild that confidence when the world is wounded, or when the citizens of the nation are wounded, and the crisis is so deep, and with climate change on the horizon, I think it's a formidable challenge. And I, I don't think they can, how would I say, do a third act of hoodwinking right now and see any constructive results. I think that's right. And, and, and you know, the Demo it's weird because the Democratic Party, like the Biden administration is pretty, you know, they're, they're on a pretty even kill. And I, I think they're making some smart decisions. But if you look at, at our cultural institutions, our universities, uh, the media, our, um, a lot of our corporations, they've gone insane. I mean, totally insane and, and really crazy out of touch in ways that I think, you know, they're trying to distract from, uh, from, from power, right? From discussions about power. And I think like the best example that I can think of is that, you know, in back in before the pandemic hit in this country in force, you know, I was paying attention to it. The left completely missed the pandemic coming like that. That's something mm -hmm. we forget about. But back in January um, and February, I was like, oh, this is going to be huge. We have to pay attention to it. And the reason is because I pay attention to China and the news out of China was the country is shutting down because of this virus that is contagious. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist or a public health expert to know that that virus is gonna come here. Mm -hmm. But 
We all ignored it. I mean, the, our elites ignored it, including Fauci, for example, including like the public health institution. They all ignored it. They all missed it. And it's like I'm some rando on the Internet who understood it because I read a book about avian flu once and pay attention to China. And a bunch of right wingers saw it coming, too. Well, the, the main one of the main arguments in January, February from the left was don't be racist against the against you know, people of Asian descent eat in Chinese restaurants because this virus, you know, don't, this is just the flu. It's not a big deal. Like the problem we have is, is Chinese restaurants are having trouble attracting customers. What? Yes, there was racism because of the, 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 the disease. Yes, there were problems in January, February. But I think if you go back and you say, is the number one problem related to this uh, COVID that people are not eating in Chinese restaurants enough. I think you'd have to say, no, that wasn't the main problem. Um, we were just missing that we were going to have a society wrenching change. Yep. And I think that's like, that is coming from these kind of cultural centers, which are really distinct from Biden. They're really distinct from the democratic party, though they influence the democratic party. They are very much associated with the Democratic Party in the minds of, say, rural voters. I mean, Tucker Carlson every night is talking about these kind of cultural centers, but they're like distinct from our from the actual choices that Democratic policymakers are making. And it, so this this like weird these weird cultural disputes, which you know generally I fall on the left side of these disputes, but like they are designed to distract us from thinking about power and substance and reality, things like diseases and supply chains and, and money. Um, and like, you know, so I, I don't know how you attack the problem of, of these cultural institutions, but the only ones who are doing it are on the right and they're doing it in bad faith. Like Tom Cotton has a bill to tax Ivy League endowment funds, right? Which is a great idea. But like, why is Tom Cotton the one coming out and doing it, right? <laughs> so, and it's like the, the, the Democrats would never touch the Ivy Leagues. You know, the Democrats are like, we want to give a bunch of money to universities because they're so great. And it's like, universities are in real, they're really badly managed right now. I mean, the same thing is true with hospitals. At the beginning of the pandemic, the Democrats were like, we have to give a lot of money to hospitals because, you know, hospitals are the going to treat people for COVID. And it's like, okay, but they're really corrupt and they're going to use this money for M and a, and they're going to shut down treatment. They're not going to treat people because they're corrupt. And the Democrats didn't pay attention and gave this money to the hospitals. And sure enough, that's what they did. And it's because this kind of like cultural, these cultural centers are so powerful and they overwhelm us being able to think about the institutional details of commerce and society and ultimately political philosophy. Yeah. Well, I do a lot of work myself in and around China from going back to 1990 when I was in the private sector. And as I watch these manifestations, I'm, I'm, I'm going to call a man that I think you know, Dean Baker, to the table. Because what he says, and I've heard this, how would I say, on both sides of the Pacific, is that when globalization happened, China is very large scale population and so forth, and their per capita income was about one fortieth of that in the United States. So the adjustment process of globalization, foreign direct investment, companies like Walmart and Nike, etc., led to a great deal of distress in America, which the Chinese will tell you they had no control over, which you might call the adjustment assistance, transformation assistance that should have taken place in America. And as wealth became more concentrated and accumulated uh, in the United States, it was used to lobby to allow what used to be tax evasion now to be tax avoidance and kept offshore, or what other things, when they talked about China as a currency manipulator, American corporations were lobbying against it because having a depreciated renminbi increased their profit margin. Well, what Dean takes all of that, how he say, uh, widening of inequality and distress for large portions of American society, is he said now it's, particularly under Trump is when he said this, they're now fighting about intellectual property rights, pharmaceutical, entertainment industry, financial access to the Chinese markets, 
And it's essentially now the very concentrated, powerful sectors, some of which you write about and criticize, that are becoming anti-Chinese. And the cultural institutions, I think, were a little bit attuned to the fact that what you might call the echoes of an American failure in political economy is now being used to demonize China as a nation. And while I'm not at all advocating for some of the things they do internally to their citizens or their structure of governance, I can see the case that Chinese, uh, how would I say, it, and this doesn't excuse at all not taking the pandemic seriously, but that ritual started amidst what you might call another process, which places like the Council on Foreign Relations had all kinds of reports starting in 2014 and 2015, mobilizing the elites for a national U.S.-China confrontation. So, so there's a, I think there's a, the basic argument that, like the most dangerous relationship in the 90s and 2000s was the relationship between the Chinese Communist Party and Wall Street. And like, the fact that the U.S. sent 74,000 factories to China from 2000 to 2012 was not mm -hmm. a, an adjustment process. It was a it was a choice. It was a policy choice, and mm -hmm. it was a policy choice by our multinationals and Wall Street and the Chinese government, um, yes. it, moving those factories over for their mm -hmm. own uh, reasons. And that relationship is still very strong. You know, you've got uh, Blackstone, which takes huge amounts of money from China. Is you know has massive influence in the U.S. Um, and it, it, it was really harmful to the U.S. and it was pretty beneficial to the Chinese government and the Chinese state and the Chinese people. And it did help concentrate wealth and power over here. But it also reduced our capacity to do things like produce, you know, uh, personal protective equipment when we needed it. And it's related to consolidation in this country. Yeah, well, that's the global like, supply chain notion. Uh, yeah, and so, so yeah. It's, it's like if you if you form a monopoly-based economic order, your policies incentivize monopoly power, which is what we've done with weakening antitrust law and changes of rules and regulations, um, and and trade law. We changed trade law. What we 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 essentially consolidated power domestically, and then we allowed China to consolidate uh, manufacturing monopoly power in shipping and a power over a whole bunch of different kind of areas. The thing is, is that now we are where we are and China does have dominant market power in a whole bunch of different sectors. And China is a fascist country and it is like Nazi Germany. So it's, this isn't coming from it. This is not a mobilization of American elites against China. This is actually the Chinese being incredibly aggressive and hostile to um, American elites or to Americans, but also to people all over the world and bullying other countries, um, threatening military action on a routine basis and censoring people in this country. Um, this isn't there. There is an ideological conflict here. It's not coming from the U.S. The U.S. didn't want this. And American elites on Wall Street didn't want this. They are they are they, they do not want they want to continue with what China was doing. They want to you offshore. They do not want. To, they did not want a cold war. The hostility is coming from China. The lab leak hypothesis, where China hid and won't let people look at why, uh, at at where COVID came from. Likely, they got an NIH, NIH grant to fund the the you know the Wuhan lab where they were doing certain very dangerous forms of virus research, and they won't let it with anyone look at it. Because they want, they don't want to take. They didn't want it to seem like the Chinese government might be responsible for COVID, even though increasingly it looks like they are. I mean, I think we have a really serious problem with China, and I think that we helped create it, just like we helped create a really serious problem with Russia. But fundamentally, it's not in our control anymore, and the Chinese Communist Party is an incredibly dangerous totalitarian force, and we're going to have to figure out a way to defend ourselves against it. I, there, obviously, a war would be catastrophic, but ignoring it and pretending it that that this is some sort of ruse by American elites, which is, I think, what Dean Baker kind of gets to, I think is really foolish and not true. And it's one of the reasons that the left is totally marginalized in this debate. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it's one of the reasons why it's really hard to get the U.S. elites to actually mobilize to address the market power problems and the corruption problems that are leading to the Chinese government actively making the case that a totalitarian surveillance state is better than a democracy. Because they, they, they say, look at America. Do you really want to be like them? And it's like, it's a pretty hard case to make um, that the democratic system is better if you can't actually run your democracy to address social problems. So the way to address the problem with China is to run our system better, but also recognize that China really does want to destroy American democracy. They want to destroy democracy everywhere because a work, working democracy is a fundamental threat to the ideology of the Chinese Communist Party. And I know this sounds very Cold war -y and crazy, but they are Marxists. They really are. And I'm not, it's not an insult. They really do believe in a specific Leninist framework for how to organize. And it's incredibly corrupt. It's incredibly dishonest. It's incredibly dangerous. And it is an attempt to replace democratic states with, you know, they'll, they could, we could still be ornamentally democratic, but ultimately like weakened and at the beck and call of the Chinese government. And that's why they're increasingly getting aggressive all over the world. So this is not just the other way that you know this isn't just American elites is it's it's not like the rest of the world is happy with China. No, Everyone's getting upset. They, they're they're yeah. rallying to the United States side, whether it's Australia or India or the European Union. You're right about that. And I think at some level, the, what you might call the disillusion that something like the WTO did not create a convergence in a multilateral system because China went another direction is uh, they find very disheartening. Well, we, we have traditionally, the, the, the way that we did globalization after World War II up until the 90s, is we said, we are going to transfer technology and productive capacity to fellow democracies, basically. We are gonna say mm -hmm. Japan, mm -hmm. South Korea, Taiwan, um, you, you, you are military allies. We're going to transfer a bunch of technology. We're going to let you into our markets. We're going to educate your scientists and students, and we're going to trade with you and vice versa. And same with Western Europe, rebuilding all of that. And we did a bunch of really terrible things in Africa and Latin America. I mean, it, it wasn't a, a, a an unvarnished story of success, but just strategically, we did not share technology. We did not place factories in the Soviet Union. For example, we didn't say, sure, you can make all of our vitamin C and all of our essential chemicals for medicine. Like, we just didn't do that because we understood like we are strategic enemies, competitors, whatever. The shift in the 1990s is we stopped linking military alliances and democratic structures with our trading arrangements, which was just probably the most strategically inept thing that we've done in American history. Like not just not just like. In, a lot, in recent memory. I mean, it's probably one of the worst things. America has always been able to produce enough for itself. That's one of the things that like, kind of right after the Revolutionary War, that is effectively what our strategies were in the 1790s and early 1800s. And we gave all that away in the 1990s and 2000s. That is a crazy thing to do. And, um, and we did that because Wall Street said, well, we don't really care what the Chinese political order is. And the more it became obvious that the Chinese political order, that they were like, we're not democratic. We, we saw what happened with Tiananmen Square and we're not going to allow that. And we're going to we're going to create a, uh, we're going to move from just straight up Marxism to a kind of weird ma nationalism with, with Marxist mm -hmm. overtones. Like and we didn't change our strategy, even though they were, you know, ripping off our businesses and and getting more aggressive internally. And now we're at a point where they're starting to push against us, starting to push against people all over the world. And we don't really have a choice about whether to change our strategy because, you know, it's really dangerous what they're doing. Yeah. And it's very dangerous in, in multiple realms. I've gotten to know in the last year, Daniel Ellsberg and his concerns about uh, essentially what he calls the nuclear winner where if a large scale nuclear conflict takes place, more than just people in the cities on both sides are dying, the upper atmosphere is destroyed and creates the equivalent of an ice age and destroys the food supply on earth. And so there are all kinds of um, facets for, of, of vulnerability here and climate as well. 
And the, the way to like the best way to prevent war is to recognize the threat and actually mm -hmm. prepare for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of the like head in the sand dynamic where people are like, oh, it's just the U.S. that's creating this Cold War is actually encouraging China to get more aggressive. Bolder. Yeah. Yeah. And that, well, that, that then leads to what I think annoying strategists call kinetic solutions, a.k.a. Mm -hmm. violence, which then leads mm -hmm. to nuclear war. So yeah. that's like we got to, you know, we have to, you know, my view is we have to disentangle our economies and really just as best we can, like stop trading with them and like figure out how to coexist on this planet with just different systems. I mm -hmm. mean, and like try to deal with climate change together. And that's basically where we have to get to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'll always cite my friend uh, Orville Schill years ago with John Dury wrote a book called Wealth and Power. And he could see some of this coming. His wife, uh, Bai Feng, who passed away recently, was Chinese. And what Orville used to say is the woundedness of the Chinese national pride from the Opium War and the Japanese invasion was going to meet with the willfulness of America as the head of the world system. And that this conflict, the, the emotional intensity of this conflict was going to be very, very strong. And, and it, it's not, how do you say, in light of the scar tissue, particularly that the Chinese uh, have felt in relation to their history, it would not be easy to reestablish cooperation if it broke down. I mean, I, I guess that's a, it's an interesting ar argument. I think there's a split among China scholars. So, you know, Orville was, was kind of like the leading guy on the, you know, of that, of that old era of thinkers of, of China strategy. And then, you know, who saw China as, grew up with China as like a rural impoverished country and then saw it getting wealthier, but never imagined that China would be where it is today and actually a, an active threat to the American order and they strongly encourage cooperation. And, uh, and then you have a younger generation that grew up and saw China as a strategic competitor and like factories moving offshore and the rest of it. And they don't look at China in that way at all. I would say that I think of the opium war narrative as kind of a falsified stabbed in the back narrative that was explicitly created by the Chinese government to ward off Tiananmen Square. Because in the, in the 1980s and 90s, what the Chinese people wanted was Western-style democracy. It's what the Russians wanted, too. And the way that you, the Chinese government changed, addressed that is, first of all, they crushed the protesters at Tiananmen Square, banned everyone from talking about it, and then implemented a new educational regime that didn't focus on international Lenin, Lenin Marxism, but on national grievance. And I don't think that... Any, every country, every ethnic group, there's a story you can tell about grievance if you want. You can look for it. I mean, I was just having this argument with my parents. They're like, you know, this is about Israel. They're like, Jews have always been victimized. And I was like, not in my lifetime. Like the last 70 years, the Jews haven't been victimized. We've been the ones with power, like, you know, and, and both in the U.S. and in, in Israel. It's like, so... That story of grievance led them to certain conclusions. And my view is that that story of grievance is at best incomplete. Um, but either way, these are artificially creative narratives that have a political objective. I don't, in other words, accept the idea that China is hurting from the opium war. I think that's an orientalist and racist way to look at what happened in China. And I think that the older generation of China scholars um, really had that, like, they don't. They didn't look, and I think this is still a problem. They don't look at the Chinese government as a powerful um, group with political agency and strategic objectives, and an ability to achieve those strategic objectives without permission from the United States. And I think that one of some of the the reasons for that are are psychological and and about experience and whatnot. But I think that we have to start looking at the Chinese government as a powerful group with you know, strategic objectives, the ability to put a rover on Mars and the ability to achieve things, important things, powerful things without American permission. And as an empire, um, they are an empire. They are growing their empire. Um, and I just think we should look at it that way. This is a this is this is this is a superpower. 
Um, mm-hmm. So that that's how kind of I see that, and and that debate is really interesting because I think you see that split among the between the like older China scholars and the and I and I think Hong Kong was like a moment when that debate flipped, but mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, that well, debate's going to play out, and hopefully we won't. Some of the older more. scholars, like Michael Pillsbury, uh, he wrote this book, "The Hundred Year Marathon: China's Secret Strategy to Replace America." Uh, how would I say he he always argued from that side. Right. Yeah, and that's yeah. the, there's a, there's a right wing angle to it too. Like this is really yeah. frustrating. Again, like Tom Cotton was the guy saying there was a, a leak mm-hmm. in Wuhan and people made fun of him. And it's like, now it turns out, you know, people are like, well, there's more and more evidence that that might be true. We're not sure. And it's like the right wing was on this, you know, was on this, not necessarily for good faith reasons, maybe for nationalistic reasons um, that I think are dangerous, but you know, mm-hmm. where 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 is the reality based thinking that isn't right wing that acknowledges questions of power and deception right. and problems? Like, where is that framework? And I think that's like that's where right. it's where I am. And I, you know, it, I think it's where a lot of the Democrats are, but I'm not sure that like they're overt about it. But it's certainly a debate, I think, on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, you know, and I think, like you said, the left discredits itself by not engaging with the possibility of a threat or a dangerous challenge forthcoming. And I think that's important to uh, consider. But we've talked today about the pharmaceutical industry, the money and the politics. Uh, We've talked about the tech sector. We've talked about the failure of universities and media and so forth. How are we going to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, my friend? Well, I think you're seeing, you know, the, the, the pace setters of our ideology right now of this dominant centers of power and ignoring, you know, ignoring that power to just sort of focus on on uh, on kind of other questions which matter, but are but are not. Um, but that don't touch power directly, that don't touch concentrated commercial power. Um, th- this is big tech, right? It's, it's Amazon, it's Facebook, it's Google, it's Apple, um, it's Microsoft. These are the pace setters of our economic order. Um, and I think that we're going to be taking those apart. And as we take those apart, you know, because they are too powerful and the right and left have both kind of come to that conclusion, there are going to be so many other consequences of that choice. To take apart the most powerful firms in your economy means that you're really restructuring how you think about political philosophy and political economy. And it's going to have lots of consequences across the board in, in every industry. And you're already kind of seeing. So that's, and I think it's also ha- going to have huge consequences in terms of trade and national security. I mean, it's a change in political philosophy, I think, uh, towards a much healthier, more democratic, more populist framework. And I hope we can kind of find a way to integrate that with a new view of, of racial tolerance and diversity um, and that, you know, that's, these are, these are all complex challenges. We've never really been able to do that in America. Like there's always been, you know, systemic racism, but, um, but we have another opportunity. Every generation gets, you know, their opportunity to do this and maybe we can get it right this time. 